So that's perfect. At 15 past six, it's getting really quiet, so I didn't even need to say anything. A very warm welcome, everyone. I'm very happy that you're all here today for the last talk of the first semester of our public lecture series, Taming the Machine. Today is a joint event between our lecture series and the lecture series, Reason, Reflection, and Responsibility by the Department of Philosophy. And we are very happy and very honored uh, to welcome Luciano Floridi tonight uh, for our last talk today. Um, he's going to talk on the topic soft, uh, can you hear me? Because the acoustics is very bad, right? So I'll stick very closely to the microphone and hope you can understand me. Slower, that's never gonna work, but I'll try. So he's going to talk on soft ethics, hard ethics, and the governance of the digital. Just to give you a very short introduction to Luciano, because if you look at his website, I could spend the next 90 minutes introducing him, so I'm going, not going to do this. So just some basic information about him. Luciano is Professor of Philosophy and Ethics of Information at the University of Oxford. He's also the Director of the Digital Ethics Lab at the Oxford Internet Institute and Professorial Fellow at Exeter College. Furthermore, he's a Turing Fellow and Chair of the Data Ethics Group at the Alan Turing Institute. And he's you know, one of the most well-known um, professors working on digital ethics, the philosophy of information, and the philosophy of technologies. He has published extensively, so I'm just mentioning the last or more recent books, namely The Fourth Revolution, The Ethics of Information, The Philosophy of Information, and forthcoming actually next month, um, The Logic of Information, all published um, by Oxford University Press, and The Fourth Revolution actually won the J. Ong Award. Um, he is also, and you may know him also from many of his public roles, he is also um, a member or even the chair of various government committees and advisory boards, just to mention a few of them, the chair of the Scientific Committee of AI for People, Europe's first global forum on the social impact of artificial intelligence. He's also a member of the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence of the European Commission, who just published their first draft AI ethics guidelines, which can be commented on uh, right now. Actually, the meeting is today, so we're even more honored that he's here um, with us today. Um, he's also the chair of uh, a member of the UK government's Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, which just started but was announced um, a year ago already. And he also advises a number of companies, so he's not only advising the public, but also companies such as Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. And I think with this, I will just give the word to you um, and open your slides. Maybe. We're not quite sure about the microphone. Uh, they might be a bit loud, so if I keep my voice low, that should be okay. Sounds okay. Um, in case I get carried away by the enthusiasm for the topics, uh, please uh, signal that my voice is too um, loud. As you may imagine, uh, the first thing you have to do when you are invited is to thank the organizers. And so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but there's a particular reason why I want to thank uh, the organizers uh, slightly more sincerely than just as a performance. Uh, it's my first visit uh, to Hamburg, and, um, and I particularly uh, welcome, when I received the invitation, uh, the fact that it was a joint invitation uh, between, shall we say, computer science and philosophy. It is not your usual combination of topics. Uh, people a little bit too young in the room may think that that is obvious, that today we need philosophy to talk to computer science, and we need computer science to talk to philosophy. Trust me when I say that when I first proposed the new degree in philosophy and computer science in Oxford, something like 25 years ago, they laughed. Not the computer scientists, the philosophers. The philosophers' reply was that um, we do not join uh, philosophy with uh, topics that are so practical. Vocational being a word that you don't want to use for a topic. Uh, fast forward a few years and finally we do have a degree in computer science and philosophy in Oxford. Uh, things do change and change for the better. Uh, I think that these are two disciplines that need to talk to each other. And even more so, given the kind of world in which we live. Uh, 
So it is a great pleasure to be able to address uh, an audience that I understand is mixed and comes from different backgrounds and uh, expertise. Now, last point before we start talking about something a little more serious. When you have a mixed audience in front of you, the chances of making at least someone dissatisfied and disappointed raise with the number of multidisciplinary backgrounds. So please accept my no, preventive apology for one, saying something that you find totally obvious, someone else would not. Two, something that is totally you know, obscure, hopefully someone else will find it transparent. So I hope there will be something for anyone in the room uh, at some point, and that uh, if you find something that is not for you, just wait for the next slide. Now, the topic here is um, uh, soft ethics, how that is in the governance of the digital, as you can tell. Um, it's actually the end of the lecture, that distinction. To get there, uh, I shall be talking a lot about uh, artificial intelligence and what we're doing these days in terms of ethical framework for artificial intelligence. I will do that in four blocks, uh, and these are the four. Uh, just a touch of background uh, to make sure that you understand where I'm coming from. Um, then, uh, uh, perhaps, I'm afraid, controversial, maybe, uh, description of artificial intelligence. Here is where I'm aware of the computer scientist in the room. I shall present uh, AI as a divorce, not as a marriage. More on this in a moment. And then the challenges that that divorce have and are generating uh, in terms of ethical challenges, and why those challenges and how they can be approached from an ethical perspective. At that point, the introduction of soft and hard ethics will kick in. So to speak, uh, the end of the story is at the end of the story. Now, the background. Um, as you might have imagined, uh, everybody and his uncle is talking about you know, the topic of ethics and digital technologies. Even Gartner has picked this up as the strategic trend of 2019, which means that if you uh, get someone who says, oh, I think this is a very hot topic, uh, this is someone who hasn't read The Economist for the past year. Of course, obviously. They spent your money too going into this uh, with plenty of envy of any academic on the other side of the Atlantic. When you hear that your colleague gets uh, one billion dollars to play with AI and ethics, you become green of envy or you haven't quite understood what one billion dollars means. That's a lot of dollars. Uh, for anyone who has yeah, written a grant, you know what that means. So there's plenty of interest and um, uh, attention from society. What are we talking about when we talk about AI? I said that I'd like to present this as a divorce, um, and I will spend a little bit of time explaining why that seems to me a good perspective. It's the divorce between agency and intelligence. By agency, I mean the capacity to perform a task to fulfill a goal. It could be cleaning the dishes, ironing a t-shirt, playing chess, park a car, find the cheapest ticket for that concert online, the route from A to B, identifying the informative pattern in all those biological data, whatever the particular task in question is, that's agency behind it, and the need of being intelligent in doing so. Now, if you are a human, like myself, and you want to play chess, of course you better be intelligent, otherwise you will never go anywhere. But my iPhone, uh, which I hope you will sort of agree with me, has zero intelligence as we normally understand it, beats everybody in this room easily. Doesn't have to be intelligent, and yet it plays chess better than anyone else. That detachment is fundamental. Now, to make it a little bit more complicated, imagine we uh, separate uh, on two axes the complexity of a task and the difficulty of that task. Now, by complexity, I mean the real thing. 
Not what people normally say when they do not understand something and therefore instead of saying it's difficult, meaning I don't get it, they say it's complex, meaning it is his fault. No, that's not what I mean. I mean complex by resources complex. What the computer scientists in this room understand by complexity, for real. So imagine that complexity there is the quantity of resources required by a problem to be solved. Normally, in computational context, we would say space and time, which translates into more philosophical concepts such as no, number of steps and memory. So either one or the other of the vocabularies, that's the X axis. And suppose we list problems there from zero to one. You know that there are complex problems that are so complex that are not computable. But bear with me. Put on the other side, difficulty. Now this is a bit more complicated because um, we don't have a matrix. But just imagine the number of abilities, the uh, quality and the sharpness of the ability of the agent to perform that particular task. Now, turn on the light. That is not complex, one step, and it's not difficult. A child, unfortunately, can do it. Unfortunately, because you come back home and the lights are on and stuff. So. Tie your shoes. Well, that is more difficult. You probably remember that there was a time in your life when you were unable to do that. You learn to do that, and some people take quite a while to learn to do that properly. Mom and dad, nobody are there for a while to teach you how to do it. But in terms of complexity, it's very few steps. Not many, many, probably not as few as just one click, but surely not gazillions of steps. Wash the dishes. Well, the dishwasher gets increasingly complex the more dishes you have. A lot of dishes, a lot of complexity. And yet, as my wife will remind me, even a philosopher can do it. Not difficult. Bit of soap, clean, put away. Bit of soap, clean, put away. So it's not difficult, it's complex. I'm all pressing a shirt. Well, that is both complex and difficult, as I remind my wife who is the neuroscientist in the house, and therefore she has to do it, and is smarter than me. It's not just a matter of a little bit of soap clean, put away. No, 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 you have to be careful. You know, a shirt, you know what it means. You know, it, I'd want to do the dishes. You can do that almost mindlessly. You cannot hire without paying attention. So this is an oversimplified you know, kind of map. And where are we with AI? Well, normally, AI is very good at complexity. Shortening, facilitating, cutting down the amount of resources required to do something. But when it comes to difficult tasks, not so well, not so much. Not at the moment. Tying your shoes for a robot, it's really hard. Very hard indeed. And I'll tell you more about pressing a shirt. Uh, bear with me. So, not for today, for another time, but if I were to forecast where AI is going, is in using complexity to lower the degree of difficulty so that things become accessible to those machines. For example, like this. Uh, the tiny little bit top left is a human being, but that space has been created to make sure that the difficult task, difficult, not complex, remember, of building a car, is enveloped, enveloped being an engineering concept here, a 3D space, is enveloped within a space such that these machines who handle complexity but not difficulty can translate difficulty into complexity and build the machines for you. Is that clear? Simple. So we envelope the space to make sure that complexity lowers difficulty and they can do what we want them to do. Now, this is what, uh, remember they're doing the shows? This is what these people have not quite grasped. Now, this is a fantastic piece of uh, technology, I'll show you in a moment, but it's not where I'm going to put my money, if I have to put my money on anything. Um, this is a, a precisely not getting that AI is here 
to make sure that you bank on complexity, not on difficulty. You don't try to do the shirts as I do them, because that is a silly thing. It would be like having a robot doing the dishes at home. You won't sell it. You sell a dishwasher. A dishwasher is a 3D space. There's an envelope. A very simple, not difficult, simple process to do a lot of dishes. Complexity. I hope you get it just here. And this is what this thing, uh, poor thing, looks like. Now, this thing, uh, someone has to put the shirt there because it's difficult, not complex. And finally, sensors, mechanics, an amazing achievement. The thing does what roughly is supposed to do. Now, what is the future instead? Well, once you have admired this for a little while, um, the future is not this. Uh, this is the future. If anyone is going to iron your shirts, this is going to do it. Just check what has happened. We have enveloped the process in such space so that complexity is okay and difficulty is lowered. And this is what it looks like. You put a shirt on top and it spits out an uh, iron shirt. Mind that this is just too expensive at the moment, but it's on the market. A few thousand dollars and you can buy it. I'm told reviews. I haven't got one. They attempt in the way a little grant, one billion dollars. You can play with this. Um, I'm sure our colleagues in the States and at MIT can buy one. Um, in this case, this is the future. It's not trying to imitate how we do things, but to make sure that you engineer something that the machine is very good at. Now, having done all this, and having tried to convince you therefore that AI is not trying to build that robot, but building a robot inside which you do things, namely that you transform the world in a, a digitally friendly environment. You don't throw the digital into the world, but the other way around. It's quite straightforward to realize that we are adapting the world to our digital technologies faster than our digital technologies adapt to it. This is generating a lot of challenges. Now, this detachment and re-adaptation, who is adapting to whom, clearly creates a bit of an earthquake. The earthquake is called ethical challenges and politics, law, etc. We concentrate on, on the ethical side. What is not a challenge is the singularity, the bad robot coming, and all that rubbish, including people in Oxford, I'm afraid, have been advertising for some time. There is a reason why we do that. It sells books. Like zombie movies. Now, it's kind of computer science pornography, sort of thing. And that's okay. I mean, everyone has his own little secrets and you really want to speculate on that stuff. It doesn't matter. But seriously, I mean, spending money in this direction, a scandal. The scandal uh, is linked to that robot irony that way, as opposed to realizing that we're building the box. We live increasingly, and I hope this will be clear now, we live increasingly in a dishwasher. We are increasingly living in a world that is friendly to our machines. We are the scuba diving entities in this space. The real, so genuine local entities are our digital sort of natives, the software we're building. Thinking that uh, the big bad robot is coming uh, is a huge distraction, which I used to think was uh, funny, uh, entertaining. Uh, now is irresponsible, so um, no laughing anymore. The problems that we have are serious and they are old. This is just a reference for the people who might have not skipped that particular lecture, uh, where you realize that we've been discussing this for 50 years and counting. The first paper on top is um, uh, by uh, Norbert Wiener, uh, Some More and Technical Consequences of Out Automation, published in Science, with a reply immediately after uh, by uh, Arthur Sauer, Some More and Technical Consequences of Automation, a refutation. Now, as you know, Wiener, father of cybernetics, Samuel, father of machine learning. The two didn't quite agree about how things were going to develop, but 
face with these two barriers. They are short and they already synthesize pretty much some of the challenges we have today. Some of the things we're going to see in the rest of this uh, presentation. We, uh, back in Oxford, have been building on this tradition with a number of papers. Uh, this is just to show you that, yes, we can also publish in Nature and Science ourselves. And that's okay. Uh, so what I'm going to present in the following steps is based on this particular uh, work. Um, what happens when human to human and AI get together with that divorce and they're building the world around our machines, not the other way around. Now what happens is that we have a lot of good things to begin with. I hope this is sufficiently big for everybody down there. Uh, is an attempt to synthesize why AI can be a force for good. It can be used to do amazing things, enable our self-realization, what we want to be uh, in the future. It can be hugely enhance human agency. I would like to stop doing the dishes and even ironing any shirt. It can increase societal capabilities. By this I mean what you can achieve as a group, as opposed to every individual doing its or her own thing. Imagine an analogy, a car in the park, not moving. It is completely useless to go one by one, push and come back. Then with the satisfaction that we find in thinking, oh, at least I made an effort, at least I contributed something. No, it was a waste of time. The car did not move at all. Now, a lot of the problems we have, and not for today, so I won't discuss this, but a lot of the problems we have today in the world are problems of complexity, see it above, that requires coordination of so many agents that unless they all come together and push, it is useless. No, I can go home and sleep because I've done my little push to the old car that wasn't moving. No, we shouldn't sleep. And their coordination can be enhanced robustly by AI. The last one is cultivating societal cohesion, and pretty much the same topic. It could help us to do a better business when it comes to getting together. Anyone thinking in terms of uh, fake news, for example, and how much we can rely on already these days in terms of cleaning the infosphere, the space of information, from fake news, Trump included, possibly, all Trump, not just just in case. Um, that is something that AI could help us to do. However, all those have the counterpart. Uh, I know you know, so I'll be quite quick. We can overuse or misuse the same technology and devalue human skills, remove human responsibility, reduce human control, or erode human self-determination. Now, there's a, another corner in this picture which is normally not taken into account and is the amber in this sort of traffic light analysis of the underused technology, AI in particular today, the so-called for the economists in, in the room, opportunity cost. The opportunity cost that we are undergoing as we speak today are staggering, meaning I'm not going to use it just in case because I don't want to run into any trouble. Now consider that at least in the UK the National Health Service, the NHS, has enormous resources and capabilities to deploy AI to lift standards of living robustly. If it's not happening, it's because there is a bit of fear. The conservative uh, approach saying, I don't know, I'm not sure, rather not, better safe than sorry. So this opportunity cost are something that will require at least an ethical framework. Now, this is all pretty high level, so I'm going to come, come down a little bit into something slightly more practical and slightly more concrete. So we start seeing what these challenges are. And again, I'm still a bit abstract, but not as abstract as I have been so far. So far, I've really said just a couple of things. One, uh, where I'm coming from, AI is a divorce. Uh, the divorce is generating challenges. Those challenges are either overuse or misuse or underuse. Like what? Five possible areas of intervention. One is where we could make sure that AI 
work against wrongdoing. Now, the point here is that uh, 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 digital technologies have had this amazing ability to democratize vulnerability. That sounds a little bit sophisticated, but it's a very simple idea. Anybody in his uncle is now at risk. Not just the poor, the disenfranchised, the uh, powerless, but anybody. By this end, for example, that when, not if, but when BA, British Airways, lost a gazillion data recently, it didn't matter whether you had bought a first class ticket or the cheapest possible bargain. Vulnerability throughout. When your no, credit card company you know, has a, a security breach, it doesn't really matter whether you are someone who owes them a lot of money and you know, use it only for a few no, euros or you are a rich guy. The democratization of vulnerability means that the ability of AI to support the good guys against the bad guys is huge. Now, mind that I'm happy to discuss this more in details, but for example, at the Alan Turing Institute, we've been working with the Metropolitan Police to analyze where AI is going to be more likely deployed in order to support organized crime. And for example, when it comes to identity theft and money laundering, AI is a blessing. Remember that organized crime is always at the cutting edge of any technology we develop. If you want to know what's the best thing in town, try at least to ask them, because they know. Identity theft is probably something that you all know very well, and imagine what AI can do for you instead of having to do identity theft by hand. A blessing. Point number two. AI should be there, remember the green color, not the red, not the amber, to enhance human decision and control. We need AI pretty quickly, pretty desperately, because the world is getting more and more complex by the day. Remember, complexity, the bottom, the X line. How no, many steps and how many memory do I need? Well, like what? Like urban uh, cities, uh, urban contexts, temporary environments. The data there, which I hope are sufficiently readable, but the bottom uh, right says 2050 is a prediction, shows where humanity is going to live in the following years. As we all know, we will be living in increasingly larger urban environments. Their complexity is skyrocketing. Now, just garbage collection in a town like Hamburg, I cannot even imagine what it looks like. So, the counterpart of all this is some smartification, quote-unquote, and we know what that means, so maybe even a few bits here, a few bits there, but a lot can be done. And it's not just Rio de Janeiro, Barcelona, and you know, maybe another couple of cities uh, in, in the world that can do that. Now, the challenge, therefore, here is complexity. Can we gear AI around that? On this topic, I will spend a little bit of extra time uh, because um, there is more to be said and more sort of silly things to eliminate. It should support our responsibility. Um, in what possible way? One that I'd like to stress is uh, caring for the whole world. Now, some of you might have heard, as I have, the lingo, oh, can we do human-centric AI, human-centric IoT? human-centric cloud computing, human-centric whatever. No, please stop, stop now, immediately. That's the history of this biological species on this planet. We've been human-centric forever. That's how we destroyed our planet, by being me, 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 human-centric. Once again, have we learned any lesson about what centrism we should adopt? So unless AI helps us to expand and possibly invert who is at the center, who is at the periphery of the ethical discourse, we're not learning the lesson correctly. So next time you find anyone, especially companies, oh, human centric, that's just reassuring. And it's reassuringly wrong. Not human centric, no. Planet centric. The whole universe centric. 
anyone except you, but us, because that's how we got into trouble. Exactly in what sense? Well, we used to come from a circular economy. Um, remember that uh, in the 100,000 years of our roughly sto story on this planet, 90% of those 100,000 years had been you know, pre-agricultural revolution, meaning that what you find is what you eat. Uh, and if you don't find anything, you don't eat today. Uh, now, the past 10,000 years have been agricultural revolution and so on, and across most of those hundreds of thousands of years, we've been recycling because we didn't have anything to waste. I still remember as a kid you know, in a small village in Italy, you didn't throw your bottle away because that was useful in a few months to put the tomato in. Not because it was so environmentally minded, but because there was nothing to waste. So we come from a long, long, no, millennia long history of circular economy, reuse everything, poverty. Very recently, and this is literally a matter of a few centuries, industrial revolution maybe at most, we moved from circular to linear economy. We started getting, consuming, throw away, get, consume, throw away. And that was a good thing. That was the only way of lifting you know, millions and millions of lives out of poverty. The fridge is like that. You buy a fridge, you use it, at some point you throw it away and buy a new one. That was linear and rich. This shift from circular, poor, to linear, rich, was technological. That's what technology has done for us. So normally, if you go around in political circles, as I unfortunately sometimes do, you bump into someone who is old green. That's the technology they have in mind. The technology that has ruined our planet by transforming a circular economy into a consumeristic linear economy. Partly true, partly false. But you have to remind that person that there is a new technology that is trying to transform the linear rich into circular rich. In other words, an economy that is plant oriented. It can be done, it can be done especially in places like this, in a few corners of the world where we are already rich enough. So, to the new person, you have to explain to the old green that is a new green. And the new green sees the green and the blue as partners, as friends. Is there one of the few good things we can do in this century? I don't think anyone can disagree. The strength of an environmental politics, economics, etc., green, with the strength of a digital, technological, intelligent policy economy, together, the green and the blue, well, that certainly is an ingredient of any good strategy moving forward. Number four, and it gets longer as we move forward, but uh, I'll try to be short on this. We have to make sure this, uh, remember the green column? That works for us, not the other way around. Now, the challenge here is work. And sure as hell, you must have read at least one article that says, AI is coming, is ruining my economy, is taking my jobs away. Um, uh, by the way, it is not AI, it is a migrant, so the alternative is one of the two. It's more complicated, a lot more complicated. So we are uh, often working as human interfaces. Um, uh, this gentleman had a job because it was a human interface between me and the elevator. You have to have some kind of driving license to operate that machine, so he had a job. Remove the legal requirement to have that driving license, he doesn't have a job anymore, and I'm pushing the buttons. The lady in question, she's also an interface between the car and the GPS. Her job may or may not go. The gentleman in question, his job is not going at the moment because he is an interface between the pump and the car. Imagine how silly if only we had thoughts about what we were doing. We have robots on Mars, but we still have to have a human being and nothing else to pick up that thing, stick it in and put it back. Millions and millions and millions of times a day. There's a billion cars in the world and more, so you can imagine. Bad design, anyone? Uh, have you seen what they're doing with the electric cars? Pick it up, stick it in, no, please. Come on, no, 
If you learn anything, can we do something bad, talk, sigh, automatic? I don't want to see a human being no, unplugging something, plug it in and plug it back. But I see that it comes where we go. Now these are going as jobs. If anyone wants to know when AI is going to make a difference, well certainly in the area where a human is an interface between A and B, do we really need that? No. One of the most spectacular piece of evolution in the universe to do that job. I'm not quite sure. Elevator, anyone? So this job is going to, I mean, anyone scanning beans? I don't know about that, so in Oxford, we all scan beans by ourselves now. The, the lady in question is not helping you anymore. There will be more interfaces. There will be more interface jobs coming and going. So what's the situation here? Well, this is the normal picture you get from the job market in the United States. Services are going up, manufacturing is going down, government is stable, and agriculture is negligible, no matter what they say. Or negligible in terms of number of jobs and GDP. So, whatever you want to look at, uh, America could stop being in the agricultural business, he wouldn't quite notice, okay? This is uh, uh, all together, so if you put in one line services, government included, this is the only area where jobs are increasing. The other two are either stable or decreasing. So, anyone dealing with bioware, goodbye. Anyone dealing with uh, hardware, stable, soft. Where that's where the jobs are still there. And what happens? Software, interface, AI. Oh my goodness, there won't be jobs anymore. What are we going to do now in a 50 years? This is the number of um, speculations that you find uh, at the moment around the web. Who said what about how many jobs are going to be destroyed by the arrival of AI? Now, I like to say this on record, so uh, it's a big, I need to be careful. Don't want to be too arrogant. My bet is that they're all wrong. That's me being careful. Why do they wrong? And my second bet is that uh, those are numbers pretty much toss the coin. Intuitions. I have a hunch. Let me give you one hunch. Driver's cars. They're coming. Who is going to work in the truck driving industry? No one. Trucks will drive themselves. Now, the data you find there are from the most recent 2015 Tracking Association report, and they show the gap between jobs offered and jobs fulfilled. By the time well, we will be in 2022, and that's around the corner, there will be something like 239,000 jobs not fulfilled. The Just the American industry is missing now a quarter of a million of jobs because people don't drive trucks anymore. Oh, just in case, I check how much, I don't, I don't have any idea how much a truck driver earns, maybe it's a terrible job. The average, the average salary of a truck driver in the United States, which is a specialized job, is comparable to the average salary of an associate professor. So, any student who wants to change job, there's a future here. This is the car industry in the United States. How many people work in the car industry, car industry producing cars, not selling, not repairing, producing cars? You don't have to read the small numbers. The bent is before and after the uh, crisis in 29, uh, 2010. We're almost, not quite, back where we are. So what's the problem here in this particular case? Is that we make a couple of mistakes all the time. That's what the intuitions go wrong. Work is a finite thing. You have a slice, this is for me. Totally wrong. For anyone who's done any chore during the weekend, clean the house, you know that it's more and more and more. You run out of time, you run out of money, you run out of energy, there's not enough people. Whatever it is, it's not because there isn't enough to do. So what is true is that the amount of work is endless. Is there economically viable that is coming with a threshold? But that is exactly what technology has always pushed forward. So you start looking at how many people work for Amazon, how many people have had a job because it's eBay, how many people work because they are cheap airlines which are made possible by IT. On and on. And you start getting this kind of This is the real world. This is something that today there was more news of a similar kind from Britain. Uh, Lloyd Banking Group revamps to affect thousands of jobs. For those of you too far away, 6,240 jobs going 
8,240 created, 2,000 jobs more. What, what happened here? The tragedy is that they're not the same people. The people going are not the people hired. There is a discrepancy between those who are paying the cost of this transformation, which is immense, and they will be left with all the bills and no advantages. And the generations to come who will see the advantages and will not have paid the cost price, so pain, to get there. Now, that is unfair. And that's why uh, in unsuspected times, I've been always in favor of borrowing a little bit from the future to make sure that the people now who are witnessing the transition are not suffering the full price of this transition. That to me is welfare. That's what we need in terms of organizing our society. Not exactly your average Tory thinking, I'm afraid, not exactly what Theresa May, I suspect, would subscribe. But then, what does she subscribe? So the end of work is not uh, in view exactly as described, uh, but yes, the end of some skills, absolutely. The end of some business model, totally. The end of work, well, maybe the end of some jobs, yes, but some of the jobs will come. This is the end of partly a recently acquired taste, the taste of describing ourselves as our jobs. Well, maybe that is going to be just a little bit challenged, and it's a good thing. Because I'm not my job. I'm not my sort of business card. And that acquired taste is very recent. You just have to read Jane Austen, not even Shakespeare. In Jane Austen, anyone who has a job, ah, terrible people. Who? No, people employed or mechanical people in Shakespeare were Marco Aurelius. So, well, Caesar and the other are walking in Rome to some mechanical people. Now, don't get me wrong, it's important part, etc., etc. But this identity, I and my job is a part of the key in society, and therefore when I lose it, I'm no longer anybody because I don't have a job. If that goes, that's a good thing that AI could do for us. Disruption, impact, minimization, benefit, inequality, skills. All this for another day because we don't have time. So please don't get out of this room and say, no, oh, he thinks everything's going to be fine. No, it's not. It's problematic, yes. It's a big shift, enormous. Is it simply robots and AI is coming, jobs are being destroyed, what do we do? No. That is being blind to the obvious. Finally, and last point, then I'll be short on this. It should make us more human. Uh, there are many ways of understanding this, but autonomy is one of the few things that we really need to be careful about. Let me give you one piece of data and then uh, a bit of philosophy. This straight line, beautiful as it is, shows the growth of how much we have spent in billions of dollars, 33, between 2013 and 2017 in so-called programmatic advertising. Now, programmatic advertising is what you have behind the scene when you see a pair of shoes instead of a racket while Googling something. Someone has to fight for that space. On Facebook, on Google, or any website where you see some advertisement, that immediate, extraordinary fight costs a lot of money. We have been spending $33 billion uh, to make sure that I sold those pair of shoes. I didn't see their racket. That means influencing people. Now, the thing that uh, I am particularly, but not only, concerned about when it comes to AI, it's not so much of the big world coming up, but that relentless, gentle, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months a year, nudging, that the AI will be there for no particular nasty reason. You enjoy this novel, you may enjoy this other novel. You enjoy the first Harry Potter, you may buy the second Harry Potter, and you buy the second one. Oh, now you enjoy the two first Harry Potter. Would you like to read the third one? Of course. And a decade later, that's why you have read all Harry Potter. And you don't even know why, but no, the first, the second, the third, the fourth. Netflix, anyone? Oh, you enjoyed this TV series, you may enjoy this other one. 
and slowly, gently, kindly, the drop of that water will calm the stone. So when we think, oh, surely autonomy, human beings, no, we can do, we can, yeah, but remember the stone who felt so safe when that drop was coming relentlessly, every day, constantly. We need to be careful. In terms of real conversation, uh, I cannot be too specific, but talking to some people who have an immense uh, website where you can see a lot of videos, and arguing, can you please put a limit to how many videos can automatically go to the next, the next, the next, the next, and, and seeing that the person in question is like, why? Well, because that is relentless nudging. And after three hours, I will have watched now maybe 15 videos without even knowing. That is what I'm talking about. Now, finally, we come to ethics. So, I didn't even say much. I'm afraid. Many words, but very few ideas. A divorce, the divorce is causing problems. And I gave you a few examples. What can we do to approach the divorce so that these problems are less so pressing? So that the green column happens, not the red, and we sort of avoid the uh, amber. Well, normally this is what you find in uh, policy uh, context. Customers, citizens, etc., us, the people, are constrained by business, what business provides in terms of opportunities, capabilities, uh, Opportunities, constraints, and business is constrained by law. What can or cannot be done in terms of what is legal and is not. Recently, ethics has appeared, especially in digital context, as the bigger context, which constrains law, which constrains business, which constrains customers. And it's quite clear that at some point, customers have an input in all this through the ethics. Now, this means simply that the socially acceptable and the socially preferable shape the sort of cultural, ethical atmosphere that then leads to regulations, maybe self-regulations, maybe the direct law, which then makes business behave in a certain way, which then makes exception. Now, you know that picture, there's a bit of a mix and match, and people get confused, so here's a bit of a clarification. We've got ethics on the one hand, which affects regulations and governance in terms of acceptability. I almost wrote there, preferably, but acceptability is a lower standard, something you can put up with, ethically speaking. And that's how you shape regulations and governance. Well, governance, in a moment, is not exactly regulations. Well, regulations are affected at least partly by ethics, but also by economics and many other things, um, culture and so on, religion, um, affects governance through compliance. And compliance is the minimum threshold that you need to be able to overstep to make sure that you are on the right side of the law. And finally, governance. What you do, for example, in your department, in your company, uh, in your uh, organization. And governance could be something also that has got nothing to do with ethics or regulations. Maybe how many people have access to that particular database. It's not a matter of law and it's not a matter of ethics. It's a matter of organizing, say, information flow or accessibility, etc. You get a picture. So, what's the role here for a context in which we need to regulate AI from an ethical perspective, not just straightforward regulations as in law, and not just simply governance? So, working on the green side, this is where this distinction that gives the title to this sort of talk um, kicks in. The distinction between soft and hard ethics. Now, I know this is when I'm aware of the philosophers in the room, so. Forgive me for being really always simplistic. If someone does only one course in ethics for beginners, uh, a couple of things are normally obvious. First, all the questions are about me. Who should I be? What should I do? And why should I do it? Remember, human centric, not a good idea. But that's the tradition we come from because I'm worth it. Me, me, me. Okay? We are the teenager in the history of this particular planet. The party must be about me. Me individual, me humanity. But that's the problem. In the same sort of simplified course for beginners of ethics, you also find hard ethics. The ethics that tells you who should you be, why should you do it, why you should do it, no matter what. As they used to say, per mundus. Be the world damned, 
that's the right thing to do. And it's a good lesson in ethics. So no matter what law says, if this is right, it's right, and I don't care. South Africa, apartheid, I don't care, that's the law, I'm not going to do it, etc. Fine. So that's the hardcore. It's also what normally parents teach kids. No, don't do it, why? It's, that's, that's the way it is. But, well, it's like a no, God sent law. It's not like that everywhere. There's also a soft way of doing ethics, which is normally what we do in, in Europe, for example, in terms of dealing with companies. We have plenty of regulations which we expect them to comply with. So that's the first constraint. We tell them, look, compliance is not in question. I assume that you, company, uh, potentially say an American company, maybe from California, uh, you decide to do business on this side of the Atlantic and compliance is expected. Then we also expect them to respect human rights, at least uh, in this small place called Europe. Feasibility is essential. Remember singularity and all that fancy stuff about robots coming, etc.? I don't think so. We regulate on stuff that is feasible. So feasibility grows, look at the arrow time, grows and grows and grows as we move through time. Technological feasibility is constrained in terms of what we should be doing as agents by human rights on the one hand and compliance on the other. And all the space in front of us, they're soft ethics. It's not hard, it's not going against the law, it's assuming that the law has been respected and ask the question, over and above the law, what is the right thing to do? Now that seems to be okay, well, but is there any space there? Plenty. I mean, in fact, that's most of the you know, life of an ethical human being. Over and above you not know, respecting the traffic, light or the rules of uh, driving around, what else can you do? Well, you can be a bit nice, you can do a bit more. So there's plenty of examples here by companies, governments, individuals, etc. that are clear about this simple distinction and in case anything so far was not sufficiently uh, uh, so clear. Law provides the rules of the game. If you don't play according to the rules, you are up to the game. You get a fine or whatever. Soft ethics tells you how to win by playing their game, which is not by playing according to rules only. People, trust me, not in this room, but sometimes get confused. Oh, that's not, well, it's necessary, but it's insufficient. The law is absolutely necessary to do the right thing, yes, but it's hugely insufficient. Even in a context where we like what we see, when the law is okay, when we assume compliance. So the kind of ethics that you need to develop in this context is post compliance, post visibility, post human rights, ethics, simple. I could have started this half an hour ago, but it would have been a bit obscure. But the post compliance ethics that we have in mind is exactly what we have developed with this particular project with Atomium, the European Institute for Science, Media and Democracy. It was the first global forum on the social input of AI. We completed work uh, after a year uh, and we published uh, in uh, December, so uh, only last month, the report is, um, the red bit uh, shows that it's freely available online, uh, open source, uh, feel free to download it. The soft ethics that we develop there, remember, post feasibility, which is really a content requirement to be honest, you cannot ask someone to do something where it's not possible, that's something that's impossible, so we call it post feasibility, it's, it's fancy. Post feasibility, post compliance, ethical framework for AI to make sure that AI works along the green, not the red, not the amber, on at least those five areas where you're standing in the nice picture here. So this particular uh, work, um, uh, we did two things uh, and we come to the end of my talk. The first half uh, does the typical uh, scholarly work or a meta-analysis of all the other ethical principles that have been put forward by some of the major projects around the world. Now, uh, I listed there six, but there are many more. From a cinema AI principle in 2017, all the way down to tenets of partnership on AI to benefit people and society in 2018. Plenty. And you don't even have to take a picture because um, it's in the paper. Um, and we discovered the obvious, that 
Anyone wakes up in the morning, takes a yellow stick, puts it on the wall, and decides these are mere ethical principles for AI. It's not so nasty, but there is a lot of um, let's invent because no one has ever thought about it. Now, uh, this is a serious business. You know, we've been doing ethics for no, 25 centuries in this corner of the world. Maybe someone should have read, should have checked. Anyway, guess how many principles we uh, collected by meta-analysis? 47. 47 principles for socially good AI in Europe. Clearly not feasible. Second problem. If you have so many principles and you have a company that may not be so inclined to do the right thing, the next thing that happens is that they go shopping and they like principle 2, 3, uh, 15, 27 and maybe a pinch of 9 but not too much. If you have 47 ways of talking to each other, you bypass each other very easily. So we restricted that to 5. The meta-analysis was quite obviously leading to pretty much saying the same thing in most of the cases. Now the top four for the philosophers in the room come straight forward from bioethics. Unsurprisingly, there's a context where applied ethics has done an enormous amount of work. We've been distilling, debating, revising, reforming, improving our ethical understanding for decades, if not longer. And we had identified beneficence, no maleficence, autonomy and justice, and plenty of stuff under each label as the four principles that are leading in bioethics. All we had to do in our work was to add an extra one, explicability. Why? Well, because remember what I said at the very beginning, it's a divorce. A divorce between what? The need to be intelligent and a new form of agency. That agency is not to be found in bioethics. In fact, it's not to be found anywhere else in the history of ethical discussion. Until recently, we have a new form of agency. We need to understand how it works and how you explain to me how it works. Explainability and intelligibility. One word, explainability. So that's the fifth principle. And out of that, we provided 20 recommendations for the European uh, uh, Commission. There's a happy ending. The happy ending is that, uh, uh, as we speak, if you check the current version of the guidelines for socially good for ethical AI, which we, a uh, member of the group, have produced as the high-level group appointed by the European Commission for good AI in Europe, the section on principles has adopted these five principles. So we start looking at a bit of uniform vocabulary and it doesn't mean that we're going to do the right thing, but it means that when we will not, we will know clearly what went wrong. It's a bit like talking in terms of the car industry having the same standards. It's not that they don't mess around, but at least you know what they do. And that is the end almost of my talk. We do have a vocabulary now, we do have a bit of a, a framework. There is now something that can be done to move forward. Now, the conclusion is uh, quite straightforward and simple. This soft ethics that I tried to sketch, and I know it was a long run up to that particular point, uh, is a way of taking care of that particular divorce, but I believe it would be powerful in other contexts. Whenever you have ethical issues that are okay, legally speaking, but you understand there's much more that needs to be done, and could be done. So it does have a twofold force. On the one hand, it's a brilliant piece if you develop it properly to manage your risk. You can tell that I tell this to companies or governments uh, in Germany as well. If you want to anticipate your problems, you want to be on the right side of things, you need to be able to show that at least you did your best to win the game. Remember, win the game. Playing soft ethics, not just according to the rules. It's never enough. Whether Cambridge Analytica was a legal or illegal maneuver, if Facebook, no, were able to show that they did their utmost in terms of soft ethics, they would be in a different sort of uh, situation. Opportunity strategy. Remember the amber? Some of the amber problem 
problems, things that we're not doing because of some kind of a perhaps misconceived precautionary principle, better safe than sorry. Well, once you start saying, look, it is safe, you don't have to be worried about being sorry because it's okay. This is where, you know, winning the game or what winning the game looks like, but all of a sudden we are in the right place. One example, because I know that we're running out of time and I, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for discussion. Recently, uh, I got um, a donation, it's a gift, no strings attached, from Microsoft to develop a piece of research. The piece of research that I wanted to develop was, can we have an ethical code or practice, ethical guidelines, so that anyone can donate her or his own medical data after death in the same way as I can donate my organs. I would like to be able to tell my doctor, look, when I die, use anything that can be used, including my data. At the moment, there is no country in the world, nowhere, where you can do that. There is no X you can put on a website saying, please, go ahead, use my, no, liver and my, no, medical data. So we developed that project. Well, that project looks exactly like soft ethics. It's not a legal requirement. No one has to do it. It's voluntary. And it will be part of winning the game. A generation donating data, medical data, to the next generation. The same way in which we donate our blood, our organs. Why not our data to improve the future? And mind, in this case, lower constraints in terms of privacy. You're not going to be around anymore. Less interesting in identifying you no matter what. And lower risk in terms of therefore consent. So you can tell that there are ways of playing the game intelligently that are a design issue. And that's what I want to end with. Really, three or four points. I wanted to introduce this soft hard ethics and I did that by walking through the AI uh, impact. I describe AI as a, as a divorce, you know, not a marriage. It's not a marriage between biological intelligence and hardware or software. On one hand, it's actually a matter of making sure that hardware and software can do things without having any need to be intelligent. The divorce generates some problems. Those problems can be so, captured in uh, different ways by either governments, legislation, or ethical analysis and solutions. I discovered that as soft ethics, when soft ethics is post-compliance. Post-compliance ethics is a way of winning the game, not just playing according to the rules. Oh, then I don't have to play according to the rules. Okay, out of here, you didn't get it, okay? Of course you have to play according to the rules. That's the law, but it's not enough. You need to do much, much more. And the conclusion, therefore, is that there's plenty, an enormous amount of work that can be done I provide five areas of applications, but I'm sure anyone here has had or his own no, preferred areas of uh, impact. The last point I want to uh, stress is that uh, if you get this particular trajectory, then our concern here in Europe about technology and innovation may not be so justified. The fact that the future belongs to those who will do the governance of the digital rightly, then to me, is where we have won a European advantage and where we need to invest seriously in this kind of the world. Technology innovation is essentially important, viable. It has to be done. Someone will be doing it, but the edge will not be there. I have the impression that the edge of a decent society where people want to go and live will be in terms of good governance of the digital. That's why this kind of uh, uh, meetings uh, matter very much, at least uh, to me. Before leaving you, therefore, what should we do? We should think much more deeply. Uh, that's bad English, by the way, just for the recording. I know it's bad English, but it sounds good in that particular line. You don't say, think more deeply, didn't quite work. Think deeper, uh, as someone who doesn't speak good English would say. Way, way more deeply. The thought that we have at the moment is that, no, come go, rush, break, break fast, break often. Seems like there must be so 90s. Be careful, be extra careful, be, th no, think twice before doing something. At the same time, be mindful, mindful, remember, not among ourselves, 
about the whole business here. I know you know, but that's for the record, shall we say, for anyone out there who has voted for Trump, for example. My dear, we're the strong the universe right now, as we speak, so we need to be mindful. We need to care more about anyone. Care is a matter of putting yourself at the periphery, not at the center. The parents care for the child, they don't put themselves up front. The teacher cares for the students, the doctor cares for the patient, the nurse, anyone doing a decent job care for the other. That is, to me, the best lesson we can learn from applied ethics in the last so, 50 years, from brand ethics, medical ethics, environmental ethics, digital ethics, and ethics of care. And I know that comes from feminist uh, context. So all kind of given to those who have not brought, uh, opened up this particular chapter. And finally, not for today again, but in the book, shall we say, that one day, hopefully, I will write on this, design is the key of all this. Many others are, if not the only key, but surely, how are we going to design our technologies, our policies, our laws, our rules of the game, our society, is essential. So, why so much emphasis? Because, uh, speaking now to the philosophers, we philosophers have been obsessed with the other two, with discovery or invention. Remember when you read anyone, the classics, it's either here, invented or discovered there in the world. And the realists and the anti-realists and the idealists and so on, they keep not ping-ponging this. At some point you start realizing that there's a third element here, which is design. There's a way of coming to grip and compromise, exploit. Constraints and affordances provided by the world. It's not about inventing and it's not about discovering. It's about putting together in the right way to solve a problem. That's the thing, is exactly what the future looks like if we do a good job. Hopefully it's up to us to do that. Thank you.